access the podcast of OA, located deep within Sector 14845, and powered by the Emerald Light of Will. The podcast of OA is your guide to the Green Lantern universe. Hosted by Lantern Myron Rumsey, the podcast of OA begins now. Hey, Green Lantern fans, welcome back to the podcast of OA, the Green Lantern podcast by fans for fans. And uh, this is episode number 207. This is Myron Rumsey, your co-host. And as always, I am joined by my good friend, Phil Bova. Phil, my friend, I am really excited about this episode. We've got some good comics that we're going to be talking about. Cool issues. And the appearance of one of my favorite villains, of course. Yeah, yeah. This We're, we're going in the Wayback Machine. You, know, you and I were talking about... Uh, the Jeff Johns run, I think the last time we did was about a year ago, which there's an irony to that when we actually get to talking about the books we're going to talk about this time around. But we thought, well, since there isn't a uh, an issue of the new series, let's go back and continue our exploration of the Johns run because this show didn't start until 2011. So all of those books that took place in the, the Johns run up to that point, we did not cover. So this is fresh territory for us, even though we're looking back on old stuff. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, three years is coming up on, what, 20 years that was released? Was that 04 or 05 when that came out? Yeah, yeah, this, these issues we're going to talk about tonight was from 2006. I'm like, holy cow, man. Oh, boy. <laughs> you know, and that's where it gets back into the conversation about this generation of Lantern fans that aren't the same generation that there was before. And I, I don't know, I just, I don't know. That's a whole different, uh, whole different topic let's stay on point <laughs> <laughs> well whether whether you're a new green lantern fan or you've been around from uh, for a long time like phil and i have we're glad to have you be a part of our show and uh, be joining us as we talk about uh what is essentially the golden age of green lantern really when you get right down to it uh, in terms yeah, of its popularity that, that's for sure so before we get into talking about the Green Lantern comics, we're going to be talking about Green Lantern number 10 through 13 of the of the John's run. Uh, we've got a little bit of Green Lantern news, uh, some some uh, controversial stuff going on. But let's start out with the for the third month in a row, there's no Green Lantern book solicited uh, for June. So it's April, May and June, although the issue that was supposed to be out this month is coming out in the middle of April. So. Uh, three months without a Green Lantern book, though, that's, uh, I, I, I don't know what to make of it. You know, part of me is like, well, they're, they're kind of stealth canceling the book because it wasn't doing that well or it was controversial or or people weren't really dig, digging it like they thought that it was going to. Or is it because of the whole thing with Dark Crisis and the death of, death of the Justice League that they want to make uh, the last issue come in closer to that and start up after this is all over, which... I, I get that point, but first of all, I don't think DC is that smart. Uh, and two, uh, I, you know, why aren't they doing that for other characters? So I, I don't, I don't know what to make of it. I don't know. I don't know how you'd have. Well, this will go into one of your other points. You're going to talk about with uh, Josh Williamson writing dark, uh, the the dark crisis thing, and how being more of a feature in it. I think that. If you're going to have, well, I know they're doing crossover books with all the other characters that have to do with Dark Crisis, but if Hal's going to be a predominant player in it, something must have, I don't know, some, maybe something takes place at the end of this Green Lantern run to where that's going to be the filler to where we gonna, we're going to pivot into after Crisis, uh, what's going to happen with the core, you know what I mean? That's kind of my theory. Uh, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but I, I think DC, I don't think DC would just not do a lantern book i just i don't know i just don't think that would be beneficial yeah it's, it's odd isn't it yeah so that's why i was like thinking you know at the same time well then they're probably just going to go just going to pivot into something with this character after this crisis event is over but you know we, we can only hope right uh, uh but you mentioned uh, Dark Crisis. Josh Williamson, the writer of Dark Crisis, was recently doing an interview, and, and there was some conversation about Hal, and he mentioned that uh, Hal has an awful lot to do in Dark Crisis. And he mentions a, a specific scene, and I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but it, it deals with him finding out what happened to the Justice League. Uh, but I, it sounds like Hal kind of represents the readers in some way at least in the beginning stage of the story. But uh, it seems like there's a lot of emphasis on Hal and Wally in this, which 
I'm excited for. Hopefully, it's going to be something good. Isn't uh, Necron back in this? I think so. I, I've seen either Black Hand or Necron. I can't remember which in some of the imagery, but none of the stuff that's come out. Like, there's been some of the uh, there's like a been like a, a brief preview of the art. There's no words in it, but the artwork, and I didn't see him in it. So I don't know if that was a cover image that that was leaked or. Um, and maybe I'm just misremembering because in my age, I'm forgetting a lot of stuff these days. <laughs> I think I know. I think Black Hand's going to play a part in this, so it makes sense why Hal Jordan's going to have some kind of key role. I hope they cross paths. Cross paths. That'd be cool. Uh, on the merchandise front, two more Funko Pops are coming out. One right now that's available is the Sinestro Core Wonder Woman Funko Pop, and then there's going to be uh, a Dino Lance Green Lantern. Funko Pop based on the deceased storyline. And it looks like it's a it comes in an oversized package that has a comic book cover in it. I don't know if it's it's a piece of artwork that comes out of the box or if it's just for the display or or what. I'm not exactly sure. I I pre-ordered the Sinestro Core Wonder Woman Pop from the Funko store. It was supposed to be delivered, and what arrived was a die-cast Wonder Woman Funko Pop. It was a die-cast metal one, though. Wow, okay. So I, I contacted Funko. They, uh, they're sending me a replacement and told me to keep the die-cast metal one, which is like a $40 figure. Okay, well, right on. So good I, on Funko. I, I had the Superman one on order. The one with the, It was a Golden Age Superman. It was the one with the, he was holding the car, I think. Or that was in the background. It was one of the oversized ones, like the Dino Lance one. But I never got it, so I canceled my order. I never even got my Jessica Cruz one. Huh. Never got it. I just canceled the order, and I was like, "Well, I'll just reorder it whenever I can deal with it." That, I don't understand. I got to do a conversation on Discord about it doesn't make any sense why they're doing these offshoot lantern, whatever. You know, it's like you got plenty of prime characters that you can still do a lot with, even though they've done some before in the past. But I mean, Hal Jordan, you can do a Hal Jordan variant with every single emotional spectrum and it, uh, people would buy it. <laughs> I mean, if people would. Wouldn't it be cool if they did uh, like a box set and they did uh, a Hal Jordan as Green Lantern of all those different ones, kind of like they did those DC direct figures at Comic-Con a number of years ago. That would be really cool. Well, I pay, I mean, here's the thing. Like if they did a, like say they did a box set of the blue lantern core, you know, and then they had like brother Worth in there and uh St. Walker you know, and a couple of the other characters, five of them, this is say five of them. I would pay 150 bucks for that. I'd be okay with that. Yeah, you make, you make it a smaller release and you have diehard fans who would, who would eat that stuff up. Yeah, I mean, a Larflees one with just a, with just his constructs, that'd be sweet. I'd be, I'd be down, totally down with that. But hey, whatever. That's why I'm sitting in St. Louis, Missouri and not part of Funko World. <laughs> So uh, the, the other thing that happened, I, I don't know whether people are reading the Human Target book. Uh, I myself am not. Uh, Guy Gardner made an appearance in it uh, several months ago, and so did Hal, but it was an air quote version of Hal. It wasn't really Hal. It was uh, somebody using Booster's flight ring, and it was impress- he was being doing impersonating Hal because Guy was acting rather gruff towards Ice because Ice becomes a love interest of, uh, of the Human Target in this book. And Guy comes off kind of like the abusive boyfriend, and he shows up and starts puffing his chest out, and so this guy shows up looking like Hal, and they use Hal to defuse the situation because Guy Gardner backs down because he's supposedly afraid of Hal. Uh, in the most recent issue, number six, uh, something happens rather controversial, and uh, if you if you plan on reading the book and you haven't read it yet and you don't want to be spoiled, you might want to skip over uh, for a few minutes as we talk about this, uh, but... In this most current issue, and in spoiler alert because we're going to spoil it, in this most recent issue, uh, Guy shows up and gets rather abusive towards Ice again, and it becomes um, more. It almost becomes a physical altercation, and it looks like he almost threatens to hit Ice. And as Ice and the Human Target are interacting, because Human Target is trying to defuse the situation, Ice freezes Guy Gardner, and then the Human tar- Target punches him and shatters him because he's been frozen solid. And then to add insult to injury, as the little bits of Guy Gardner are lying on the 
floor. <laughs> Ice and human target go and have an, a romantic interlude, uh, shall we say. And they do this while the little tiny bits of Guy Gardner are melting into the carpet on the floor below. Uh, now, you know, there's Wait. there's one thing to be said for how Guy Gardner is, is portrayed. Now, maybe back in the 80s, he was a little more like that. But obviously, he's evolved since then. So he's almost out of character when you look at how he's being portrayed these days. But then the fact that they killed him like that and the ring never went off and found a successor, the ring doesn't do anything. Uh, it makes me a little concerned about Tom King and all the rumors we had about Tom King maybe doing a, a GL book. And I remember Tom King saying that Hal Jordan is his, his most fun character to write in DC Comics. And he wanted wants to do something with Green Lantern. But I'm almost a little concerned at this point because since that wonderful issue that he did during the Dark Side War, there's been a lot of things that are like, I don't know if I want him to do a Green Lantern book. Uh, and, and I know this is Black Label, so you could say, well, this is an incontinuity uh, yada, yada, yada. But the downside of this is that it's picked up by mainstream media and reporting that Green Lantern was killed. It's been on a number of websites. And of course, the general population, they have no idea what this is about or that it's a, maybe an alternate reality. So it, it, it paints the franchise a bit uh, in a bad light because the average person doesn't know this is maybe out of continuity. Heck, they probably don't know what continuity even means at this point. It's the same, it's the same thing that when... Uh... Alan Scott came out as being gay. Right, know, right, right. All... He's gay now. And it's like, okay, well, you know, the average fan's just going to think, okay, they're going to think Green Lantern equals gay. But to all the fans who know the, the Green Lantern universe, I mean, they're going to say, well, okay, hold on. There's a, there's a subtext to this, even though it's still important, but make sure you understand there's subtext to this. And, and that gets lost in translation sometimes when you want to spread word of mouth, especially with crap like this. Right, right. So uh, the last little bit of news, uh, I don't do a whole lot with Substack, but Grant Morrison has been writing uh, some things on Substack. And he's been doing almost kind of like an annotation or notes about some of his work. And he just started talking about the Green Lantern season two. And he has one post that's out there. And it was interesting to to listen to him start to talk about uh, what was going on for the season two stuff because he talks about how he was he was going to walk away from the book at the end of the Black Star three issues. So there wasn't going to be a season two initially. But part of what brought all that on was that Liam Sharp was really eager to have like an absolute edition or a big collection of the series at the end of it and 12 issues wouldn't, wouldn't fit into that vision. So they kind of decided, well, let's do it again. Let's do another another year of it. And then they got told, well, you know, it's it's going to not be 12 issues. It's going to be six or less. Um, you know, basically they had gotten a call basically during that year. And he was having a rough year uh, on his own outside of comics. But he was told it was going to be truncated from 12 issues to six or hopefully even less. And the reason why was 5G. And that it was going to make way for a Jeff Lemire horror Green Lantern book. And it was going to be focusing more on a new direction for Green Lantern, uh, trying to do more of, a, how, how do you phrase it? Let's see. Um, it was going to be, they were going to retire. Basically, Dan Didio and DC Comics had, left, had plans to retire Hal Jordan in favor of a more diverse human member of the Green Lantern Corps, is how Grant Morrison says it. So that was what was going to happen. And then 5G died and he had to go back and go back to 12 issues. So he kind of only mapped out, had it mapped out for six and it got thrown to him back to 12. And he was already frustrated from things that were going on outside of the comics world. But then with DC kind of jerking him around, he was even less enthused. And so I think that might help readers understand some of the behind the scenes stuff and maybe why season two wasn't as strong as season one because season one was all mapped out at once. And when season two came, he had to completely redo everything at once. He was, you know, he just was told six issues. Now he's got to double the size of it. And so that's maybe seem why it didn't have so much tightness in its storytelling. Well, and it's funny because it's like, uh, that thread of his, I mean, I don't know if anybody's went to, uh, it's Zandom, right? Yeah. Yep. 
called the Substack. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Xanathum. Um, he, it's really cool to get a an inside take on their process when you juxtapose it next to how we were going through the issues and reviewing them one by one and by one and saying, okay, well, I wonder where the storyline's going or looking back for that matter. But then these writers and some are these, sometimes these writers and these artists come in and they start explaining their process from their side. And it's like, wow, you know, look how much could have was, was probably missed. Uh, look how many opportunities were passed up because of, whatever decisions were being made that the higher ups do. And this happens continually with DC comics and Marvel. I mean, they're notorious for this. I mean, we've, we've, how many times have we said this on our podcast time and time and time again, the, a lot of these writers that go in and start working on these characters, there's a, there's a ceiling that's there. And I bet you it's a pretty hardcore glass ceiling. That's almost impossible to penetrate. Yeah, it's 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 kind of frustrating to hear some of the things that, that, that get in the way of the creative process or the story that somebody's trying to tell. Uh, you know, I've heard similar stories from other creators that we've had on the show when we were talking off mic, and uh, it, it's it's a little frustrating from that in that regard. But you can certainly understand why it was troublesome for him to work on. And he ends this this first diary uh, of talking about Green Lantern with saying that you know, little did he know his year was going to get worse. So I don't know what what comes up through this but it sounds like there was a lot of problems behind the scenes but it also reinforces the idea that 5g was going to really shake up dc for better or for worse and uh dc obviously had plans to to shift some things around i'm willing to bet anything that this dark crisis there's some elements of that 5g in this dark crisis yeah it wouldn't surprise me any I mean, the, the thing of it is you, you can create an event, you can do what you want to do as far as resetting your known universe or however you want to spin it to the fans. But at the same time, if you're going to do an event, and when I remember leading up to 5G, it was, there was all this, you know, it wasn't big, big hype, but, you know, it was enough to, to spark fandom to where it drew enough criticism, you know, and, and, it, and at the same time, that whole whatever blew up and Dan DiDio and everybody else that was evolved and whatever happened subsequently they start publishing these titles and then ironically enough here comes dark crisis i just i think it's probably that or a modification of that 5g initiative that they once had yeah i kind of feel like they they were like well we're not going to throw out all the work we did and we're still using it and it seems like the new editors and stuff are still trying to forge ahead i just don't think it's gonna it's gonna sell well I don't think if they if they decide to go down that road, it, they're going to get pushback like they they wouldn't believe. I I know that part of it is they think that this is going to capture a new audience, but you can't try to capture a new audience and tick off the audience you already have at the same time. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure what I'm not sure what their modus operandi is. I mean, it, but then again, we could probably count on what all of our fans' hands. How many times we've said that in this podcast I mean, it's like <laughs> right you know i mean you never know what they're going to do but ironically enough when it comes to batman you just that's like a that's like a cruise control kind of thing for them because it doesn't matter what they publish oh we'll do five issues of this all of a sudden it gets critical acclaim and it's a masterpiece and the next thing you know it gets pushed to a year or two you know whereas then they make three three issues and it doesn't do as well but they're still proud of the fact that they made it and because it has batman Right, right. So that's all that's going on in terms of Green Lantern news, but we uh, we have some comic books to talk about. We've got the, the Revenge of the Green Lantern story arc to talk about, which I'm really excited for. This is one of my favorite arcs of the Jazz run. Yes, this is very, very cool. I'm in, I love this one, too. All right. Well, friends, we will be back in a couple of moments. We've got a Know Your Course segment to do, and then we're going to dive right into Green Lantern number 10 through 13. This is Salak, Green Lantern of Sector 1418, and you are receiving the podcast of Oa. The podcast of Oa. Welcome back, fellow Owens, to another segment of the Know Your Core. This week, 
and he will be featured in our talks with uh, John's era run. We have Ki Han of Varva, Kilowog's second in command. Ki Han, what is from New Earth Sector two eight or seven eight six? Excuse me. Creators are Ron Mars and Fred Haynes. First appearance: Green Lantern, Volume Three, Number Forty Nine. Shelf date of February 1994. Appearance of Death, Sadly Green Lantern, Volume 4, Number 23. Shelf date of November 2007. He was an extremely tough mentor, and more recruits flunked or dropped out than graduated. Kihan was that man. One of the exceptions to this was Liara, daughter of former Green Lantern, Kentor Amoto. She became a star pupil, and they often could be found on missions together. Kihan and Liara were two of several Green Lanterns who attempted to defend Oa from Hal Jordan, but were defeated and left for dead by Jordan. They were two of several ex-Green Lanterns taken captive by the Manhunters, who were rescued by a reformed Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner. A.R. Owens, with a cool member of the Green Lantern Corps, Kihan. This is John Carlo Volpe, producer of Green Lantern, the animated series, and you're listening to the podcast of Oa. All right, friends, we're back to talk about Green Lantern issues number 10 through 13. These are all from 2006. And this is, uh, it's interesting, you know, you and I talked about, the last time we talked about the John's run was about a year ago. And this issue, this, this story, is part of DC's one year later jump. So it's ironic that we're talking about the books <laughs> one year later. <laughs> That's fun. Uh, not not intentional. It, it was a happy coincidence. But this was, a, if, if you jump back to 2006, that time frame, DC did the Infinite Crisis event. And after Infinite Crisis, rather than restart everything, they basically took all the books and pushed them a year further down the road in terms of their continuity. And then there would be some things that were of interest that took place during that first year that would be elaborated on in the books. Also to be a break between previous to Infinite Crisis, the Green Lantern series, the first nine issues or so were, were drawn by Ethan Van Skyver and Carlos Pacheco. This is the start of Ivan Rice's run with Jeff Johns on the Green Lantern book. So artistically, it made a great break as well. Uh, yeah. So we've jumped ahead a little bit in time, about a year exactly. And in issue 10, Hal is still trying to repair his image from his time as Parallax. And it turns out that somebody, somewhere, has put a bounty out on Hal's head. So Hal is chasing the Igneous Man, who this is his first appearance. The Igneous Man apparently tried to kill Hal uh, right before this started. And Hal is has followed the Igneous Man into Russian airspace. Uh, boy, another... <laughs> Timely yeah. coincidence, right? Uh, I know, right? Gosh. <laughs> but Hal has crossed into Russian airspace. And during this time during DC Comics, they had this thing called the Freedom of Power Treaty. And the Freedom of Power Treaty were basically all these countries were signing this, this treaty together saying, we don't want superheroes in our country. We want to rule for ourselves. And Russia was one of them. And of course, Hal, as a Green Lantern, his jurisdiction is all of the earth, regardless of the fact that he's an American. It doesn't matter. And so he's pursuing a criminal into their airspace, and Hal encounters the Rocket Reds. Now, for those that don't know who the Rocket Reds were, they were created by Joe Staten and Steve Englehart back in 1987 in Green Lantern Volume 2, Number 208. And the Rocket Reds were created by Kilowog. So cool. Hal crossing into their airspace and being con confronted by the Rocket Reds uh, puts Hal into the middle of an inter international incident. And it turns out it's not the first one he's had. Uh, I guess he and John also had a similar incident, I think, right before the one-year jump. Um, mm. But while this is going on, while he's confronting the Rocket Reds, Hal starts having this flashback to something that happened during the one-year jump. And it's involved some kind of a mission that... Hal and Cowgirl, Jillian Perlman, and Rocketman Shane Sellers were downed on a mission. And Hal famously didn't have his power ring, and something bad happened. Uh, Hal wakes up, and this is where John is really pushing that ladies' man image that he's been trying to push for, 
for Hal. Right. He he wakes up with this woman. He doesn't remember her name. She doesn't remember his name. Uh, her name turns out to be Julie. Uh, you know, we kind of recounted some of that a little bit in our in our Carol Ferris episode. And then Ali shows up, and in this during this time frame, Ali is the mayor of Star City, and he kind of put, kind of admonishes Hal for his actions. And I, and I love Hal's line. He says, you know, when the uniform's on, borders don't exist. And he's not wrong. Um, no, but it's cool Ali taking a diplomatic approach to this whole entire situation for his <laughs> for him breaking international airspace, you know, going into Russian Federation airspace, you know. And Hallie's trying to be that go-between, like, look, man, <laughs> you can't do this. But I get it, but you can't do this. <laughs> It, it, it's interesting. It, it's kind of a switch, isn't it? Because Hal's the renegade and Ali is the you must follow the rules guy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it, and what, I, what I really liked about that whole this whole section of the book is it, it feels like there's a continuity in the DC universe. Like there's ongoing things in the DC universe that matter. This freedom of power treaty is nothing new and it's appeared in other books. There's really this this feeling that when you're reading a book, regardless of what it was during that time frame, that you were reading about the DC universe and you were basically glimpsing through one peephole into the DC universe and that you were kind of glimpsing in on a, on a world that was organic and real. Yeah, I, I realize it's funny books, but at the same time, it felt like there was DC really had their act together in terms of a continuity for the entire universe. Yeah. Yeah, this one was real cohesive back then. I I, I like the, the well, and I like John's writing back then too. Yeah, and and he's doing a good balance of plot and character. You know, we're finding out about how Hal still doesn't fly with the ring, and he has some regrets, and in in there's still his his sense of guilt over what happened as Parallax, and he's still kind of taking that on his shoulder. Uh, and so on. But yet at the same time, there's also a lot of plot. I mean, in, in this issue, it's the debut of Arkillo. It is his first appearance, Arkillo of the planet Vorn. Yep. And very cool. It's, it's It shows you, it's the foreshadow of the formation of the Sinister Corps. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's right. That's right, because that's the first, that's actually considered the first appearance. Yeah, yeah. So this is where we first get the glimpse of what's going on. And, uh, and again, we see a little bit more flashback towards the end of this issue, issue 10. And uh, basically, the three pilots are being awarded medals. And we find out that Rocket Man, Shane Sellers, uh, basically probably has ended his career at, by what happened. He got injured dur- during whatever happened. They were prisoners of war. They're getting medals for being prisoners of war. And while they're having the ceremony, an alien ship comes down and crashes and we end the issue finding out who's inside the ship. It's Tomar 2. And Tomar 2 was last seen during Emerald Twilight. Supposed to be dead. Supposed to be. Yes, he's air quotes dead, right? That's right. Combo, they should just comic book air quotes dead. Yeah. <laughs> what a great issue, though. I mean, it, there's a lot of action, obviously. There's so much character development. The plot pushes forward, and you get not only the plot that's going on in this arc as we're setting some things up for the story that's going to take place during these four issues, but there's also setting up with things that are going to pay off down the road when we get to the Sinestro Corps War. Well, not only that, notice the focus and attention on Green Lanterns. Yes. You know, how's the central character? I mean, that, that don't. I mean, don't let that con- conceive it because, like, he's supposed to be. But there's also other lanterns in this book. And throughout this series, and what I've what I've learned reading back through this, like we have, is the writers focus on all those characters, as we'll see when we go through the next issues. I mean, they even even Johns puts uh, little write ups about individual characters, just like as a refresher to who that lantern was, you know, and what happened, you know, and that helps it along because some pe- some readers get lost along the way of a lot of who these characters are. Well, what was really cool is is some of the characters we're going to see here uh, are are one thing, but we're also going to see, you know, at the same time you had Peter Tomasi doing the Green Lantern Corps book. So a lot of the characters that we see when Hal goes to Oa are the same characters you're reading about in the Green Lantern Corps. So it gives you that sense of cohesion between Mm -hmm. the two books, even though they're not connected necessarily at the hip until they kind of merge together during the Sinestro Corps War. They're their own entities, that's for sure. But you get this sense, this organic sense that that Tomasi and Johns have been coordinating things together 
And they're making sure that, you know, we're not just going to have a throwaway character over here if they don't show up over there. You know, it makes sense for there to be some sense of, of this is the core. This You know, you're going to see characters weave in and out. And I think that's awesome. Yeah, I've always been surprised that, like, a lot of writers don't choose to incorporate them in, in big events that take place on a, on a, like, a world, like, outside of our scale, you know, like do some research and if you're writing about a particular character in whatever book you're focused on and there's some major event that's taking place in that known universe do some research find out where that universe is located at what sector include the core in there if, if you're going to make the green lantern core the green lantern core then you got to make that story be told over multiple books not just be contained to one but you still have your central core book you know yeah yeah uh, so that was issue 10. Issue 11, we find out that Tomar 2 was on a planet in Sector 3601 outside of Guardian Space. Dark, and, dark. Not, 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 to be, not to be confused with what's going on in the Thorn Run, which is the dark, whatever that was. The dark sectors, correct. The dark sectors, yes. Yep. And basically, Tomar 2 came to Earth to kill Hal. Uh, I don't know how he knows Hal's alive, but maybe he assumed just based on Emerald Twilight and he came to Earth to, to go after Hal. Uh, so Hal ends up going to Oa. He's in the mess hall. He's still taking heat from Emerald Twilight, from uh, the characters that are there, the, the rest of the core. And he runs into Kihan's successor, Turret. And Turret starts a brawl in the mess hall against him. And Guy stands up for Hal. You know, Hal, it's funny. And I think there's, there's a piece of introspection in here where Hal's like, you know, Guy gets a bad rep. And, and here he is. He's the first one to shake my hand and welcome me back. Right. Uh, which. Yeah, I, I like I like how they're. I like how their relationships to go forward through this writing. Yes, yes. I mean, there was obviously always some bad blood. I mean, a guy, I think, always had this, how's the guy that always gets the limelight? He's always considered the best. I wasn't chosen. I was slighted in some fashion, is the way he looks at it. And he's always feels like he has to prove himself. And so Hal's just, he's the, he's the manifestation of all of his feelings of inadequacy personified. And so there were so many things that took place in the past where, uh, you know, he would, Poke Hal and, and, you know, there's a great fight scene between Hal and Guy where they fought for uh, the who was going to be the Green Lantern of our sector. That was a really cool fight. And uh, so it's interesting to see the evolution, which is nice. And we see, uh, in addition to Turret, we also get introduced to Horak Knot. And uh, as, as things are starting to get, get hot and heavy, Kilowog shows up, breaks up the fight. And then Hal has to go meet with the Guardians. And Hal wants to go to where Tomar 2 came from because in his mind, in his, his gut feeling, as he says, is that there are other Green Lanterns there that can be rescued. And if Tura 2 is alive, if Tomar 2 is alive, then maybe some of those other Green Lanterns that he's been accused of killing or murdering are alive too. Now, this is also the very first mention during this run of Blackest Night. Oh, that's right. It is, isn't it? Yeah. Yep. Uh, and basically the Guardians are, are of the opinion that the Manhunters are behind all this because in Sector 3601, nothing can survive. And since the Manhunters don't need oxygen and all those good things, uh, they're probably the ones behind this and they're true. The Guardians deny Hal's request but of course, Hal's going anyway. Oh yeah, well duh. <laughs> <laughs> he he kind of misleads Guy, although Guy probably knows better that that Hal is is going to go anyway. Sure. So they uh, they head off to uh, Sector three six zero one to see what they can find out. Meanwhile, back on Earth, uh, there's this whole thing about the Global Guardians, and they're part of this whole uh, this whole Freedom of Power Treaty thing. And she's there, and the Global Guardians are trying to recruit her into the Global Guardians, and she says no, but they kind of draft her anyway. It's, it's a little side to it. It seems a little out of place, but it comes into play later on. Uh, but when Hal and Guy arrive in Sector 3601, they can't rely on the Rings programming because they've gone outside of Guardian space. 
And they run across Biop, which is the Manhunter homeworld, and they detect human life, or they detect, detect life signs, organic life signs. And what they find on Biot is a Manhunter production facility. And they find that the Manhunters have blood running through their, I don't want to say veins, but through their tubings or their, their ductwork inside of them. So they keep looking around and they find the living bodies of what is being called the Lost Lanterns. It's Boudicca, Graf Torin, Hanu, Jack T. Chance, General Creon, Liera, and Kihan. And just as Hal finds them, and Guy find them, Hal, Hal gets attacked savagely from behind. And who is it? Drum roll. It's Cyborg Superman. Which, by the way, is one of the coolest images. Yeah. Yeah. I it's love a, that guy. Such a, such a great, uh, another, another great issue because we see more about what's going on. Uh, and there's just little teases. Again, we get, we get the tease about Blackest Night. We know something else is going on. We as readers at this time don't know what it is. We have no idea there's going to be a Sinestro Core War. So it's all very cryptic. That's, that's big vision right there, too. Because if you look at that in hindsight, I mean, wow. Two major events that took place, you know, one which impacted the whole entire DC continuity and one which didn't. But those were two big events for the Green Lantern universe, man. And not only that, notable events. You know, people always reference those. Blackest yeah. Night referenced every time. You talk to any Green Lantern fan, they have to know what Blackest Night was. They have to. If they don't, I, yeah. I, they need to go back and just get with it because without that event, I mean, you, you wouldn't be really a hardcore Green Lantern fan. Right, true, right. True Green Lantern fan. And, and you know when Johns came back, he, they talked about, he talked about in interviews that he had three major stories in mind for his arc. And you know, a lot of comparisons are made to Star Wars and that Rebirth was Star Wars A New Hope and Sinestro Core Wars is, is The Empire Strikes Back and Blackest Night is The Return of the Jedi. Uh, but he had all of those things in mind. And so there's little strands of plot that tie all these things together, which is kind of the long form storytelling, which is it's 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 great because as you go back and read this now, you start to see like, Oh, I remember now that why this was such an important thing because you might have forgotten it the first time you read it, but now in hindsight you have the luxury of knowing what's coming next, and it's really cool. Right. But yeah, that image of of Cyborg Superman holding up his hand with all the the rings in it is just an amazing image. Uh, Ivan Rice really, uh, I had not heard of him up until that point when these issues came out, and I was like, man, where was this guy hiding? Right. Now that's that's one of the cool. That's one of my my favorite figures that I own is the cyborg Superman one with all the rings on its fingers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and they, they use that for the cover of the next issue, which was such a great cover. Oh yeah. That's one of my faves. One of my faves. I'd have to say back to back when I, when I look at mine, my, with my two favorite villains in mind, that black hand cover, uh, when he's standing over the grave. Oh yeah. Yeah. With the green lantern emblem. And then this cover here with this U 12, Two of my all-time favorite co- villain covers, the Green Lantern yeah. ever. Uh, and, and it's really cool. When we get to issue 12, Hank Henshaw gets elevated in my mind. Uh, yeah. you know, going into going into this this run, Cyber Superman was a villain of Green Lanterns, of Hal Jordan's. But this time, um, this kind of elevates him to his arch enemy, not just another average villain. Sure. Sure. Especially with the Coast City. Um uh, tie in or with, with him being related to it, you know. Yep. So Green Lantern number 12 starts out. We get the debut of Moro, the Crypt Keeper. Oh, that's right. Yay. <laughs> and the Guardians know that uh, Hal and Guy have gone off the reservation. Of course. Uh, which, I mean, if they were all high and mighty and smart, they would have known that already. Yeah. And, <laughs> and then we get this really, really. I thought really well written sequence where we get a lot of comparisons between Hal and Hank Henshaw and how similar their lives their lives have been, but yeah, how different they ended up becoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it's it's really interesting. Talk about you know life isn't always fair and and you know it can it basically the line is like you know sometimes it rips the the people you love away from you. It can create pain. Pain can create fear. Fear can create hate. It happened to me. It also happened to another pilot. His name is Hank Henshaw. And we get the recounting of 
how Hank Sh- Henshaw came to be Cyborg Superman. Which is cool. And I always remember that story arc from, uh, you know, way back in, when it took place in the Superman comics, <laughs> you know, back in the day. And, and Hank Henshaw is obviously, he's, he's tied to the destruction of Coast City, as you mentioned, uh, and how that led to the, the to being, uh, how becoming Parallax. And then, you know, there was a point at which Parallax tried to kill Cyborg Superman. I think he fused him to the source wall, if I recall. Yeah. I think they mentioned that in here, too. Yep. And and Hal talks about, you know, I woke up from my nightmare. Hank Henshaw never has. Well, and it doesn't help that, I mean, with all due respect to Cyborg, he reconstitutes himself every chance he gets. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, there was one image, and I don't remember what book it was in, but it was one of the last panels of the book, and it was his just a piece of his eye, part of his face or whatever. And uh, he was thinking, I think it was Hal Jordan. He was thinking Hal Jordan for finally releasing him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then he comes back again. <laughs> but with Hal, I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he just he, he comes back. He reconstitutes himself, and yeah. he comes back. And he begs, he begs for more punishment, and it's like, all right, dude. Well. <laughs> You know, we're giving you some chances to get yourself out, but anyway, now nah, he's my favorite anyway, so I, I I love seeing him. With uh, with Hal out for the count because of the the attack on him from Cyborg Superman, it's Guy Gardner. He can't hold up to it uh, with all the other main hunters that are attacking, and so Guy Gardner is defeated. He's dragged away, and Hal is flooded with what they call Wild Hunter Nanites. And he, uh, Hank Henshaw tar- starts talking about a new director for the Manhunters. It's not to destroy life, but to control it. And we don't know what that really means yet. Uh, then we, we go back and we get a little bit more about the Crimson Fox storyline. There she is on TV speaking out against Hal, which, you know, last issue she was defending him. And now she's speaking out against him. And then we see Alan Scott, who at this point in time, uh, Alan is, I think he's in charge of Checkmate, if I recall. Do you, do you remember it all, Phil? No, I really don't. I know he's connected to Checkmate. I just don't remember whether he's in charge of it or if he's just like an agent or part of a, part of Checkmate. But he reaches out to Ali because he's like, okay, we got, we got real problems now because this is becoming a bigger problem than what we thought it was going to be. Uh, but then we switch scenes to England and we see kind of this, this underworld of mercenaries under the Thames River and uh, we find out that a character by the name of Hunger Dog, he gets a new contract to kill Hal even though Flicker, who is a Green Lantern villain from way back in the last volume, issue number 20 um, Flicker challenges Hunger Dog for the contract and Hunger Dog kills him (laughs) Pretty quickly Yeah, yeah Uh, We we get some more uh, flashbacks and some more character study on Hal as the Will Hunters try to take control of him. And Hal basically, um, we find out that Hal's attempt as as Parallax to destroy Saber and Superman is what led him to find Biot. So Hal's indirectly responsible for what's happening. But as Hal's waging this internal battle, uh, he starts to feel like, you know, well, somebody's helping me. Hal emerges triumphant from the, he basically purges the Will Hunters and he frees the Lost Lanterns and they jump into battle. And at first they start attacking the Manhunters, but once they see Hal, uh, they really make him the focus of their attention because for them, time stopped back during Emerald Twilight and the last memories they had were being defeated by Hal. Right. And it's cool how Cyborg takes a step back. You know. Yeah, yeah. He steps back and lets let them go at it, you know. Uh, Hal refuses to fight them. And that kind of, uh, well, kind of what happens at that point, Creon was like, he's not fighting back. Something's not right. You know, th- there's something wrong here. And Hal's been trying to say, you know, we got to fight the Manhunters. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about this other stuff later. Uh, so he refuses to fight and they stop just short of severing Hal's hand, which is what he did to Boudicca. Mm-hmm. And it's then that Hal sees more Green Lanterns that had disappeared, including Arishia. So the issue ends when a larger Manhunter, uh, which 
Cyborg Superman has called them the High Masters, shows up and Guy is inside of them. And this is what he's talking about when he said they were going to control life. They're going to put people inside of the High Masters and they're going to be kind of the engines that kind of keep the High Masters going. And the High Masters are incredibly powerful. Apparently they can destroy a planet with just one of them. Can you see, I, I can zoom in on the other one. Can you tell who that is in the cockpit? Uh, Guy Gardner. No, not Guy, the other one that's the right. Oh, no, I didn't see. Oh, Chazelon. Yeah. <laughs> I did not see that. Good good catch. I didn't catch that the first time when I was rereading this. And there's one in the background. It's a female figure. Down but down to the oh, left. Oh, yeah. Top. I can't tell who that is either. Ayolande, maybe? It might be Ayolande. Could be. She's got kind of like a swimsuit costume. And there were a few people that had that. Uh, her being one of them could could very well be, but uh, they're they're being attacked by them, and so now you've really got the really the the poop is hitting the fan now. <laughs> That's right. That leads us to the conclusion of this story, and we get some more flashback. And here, Jeff Johns, uh, he does a better job of explaining the age issue with Arishia. You know, they they tried to say that well, she ages differently, and yada yada, and and he kind of does that too, but he. He makes it sound a little more believable, what he didn't know. He basically says, what I didn't know is that due to the elongated orbit around the suns, 13 years on, on her planet is like 240 on Earth. Right. So they, they kind of recount some of the history there. You know, when I read this, I was like, and rereading this, I was like, you know, we just did this whole thing on the story for Carol Ferris. I really like Hal with Arishia. Yeah, their their partnership was pretty cool. Um, I like it m- better with the the explanation that Johns kind of gives, uh, rather than the ring just making her older. You know, the ring maybe aged her physically to look more of her age, but it never explained the fact that she was still rather immature, like a little kid. And this makes it make more sense. I still liked uh, how with Cowgirl. Yeah, I did too. I did too. Yeah, I like that relationship too. And they talk a little bit about what happened to Rishia when when she, air quote, died. Was, you know, she was supposedly killed by major force and was suffocated. And because she didn't have a power ring, she was die, She died. She was buried. Uh, everybody thought she was dead. But what we find out is, is well, the way her, her, her body works, the way that the, the, their race works is that they don't, like their body shut down and they reheal. Uh, and, and that she was really kind of buried alive. And then the Manhunters retrieved her body, and when her body healed, she, as they, as Johns puts it, quote, evolved into her next stage of life, whatever that means. Yeah. <laughs> quote. <laughs> yeah. So the fight's going on still, and it, it's interesting. There's like a really cool double-page splash where they're fighting, and you see Boudica just looking at Hal with all this disdain in her face. It, it, you know, Ivan Rice does such a great job of non-verbally telling the story of what's going on that, that Johns doesn't need to write anything in the script to continue the fact that uh, she doesn't trust Hal. But during the this fight that takes place, Creon is killed yeah. and his ring goes to Boudica. Which is cool because she's holding him while he's dead, his dead body. Yeah. Because you know, she lost her hand, she lost her ring. She doesn't have a ring here in this situation. So while the other Green Lanterns are fighting with the rings, uh, it, you know, except for... Uh, our, our, our good friend Hanu, who doesn't like to use his ring, <laughs> um, she doesn't have a ring. So this gives her her ring back, and like the first thing that happens is her ring recreates her right hand. That's right. This is before she becomes an Alpha Lantern, isn't it? Yep, yep. So uh, basically, Henshaw talks about the fact that the rings that he has, he's got all these Green Lantern rings from these Green Lanterns that they've captured, and he's been siphoning the ring energy from Oa without anybody knowing it. But in doing so, it's also allowed him to tap information from Oa, including some kind of a secret. And he doesn't say what it is, but he taunts Hal with it, saying that the Guardians really allowed Hal into the core only because he could serve it as an example to the others that w- this is what happens to you when you don't toe the line and you have a fall from grace. Right. Yeah, it's cool their banter back and forth. Cyborg and his. Yeah. And, and, it's cool. yeah, and what I like about this, because Menditti used uh, Cyborg. No, he didn't use Cyborg. 
Oh, I can't remember. I know Ivan Rice did Cyborg Superman. I think because he's popped up every once in a while in the Green Lantern books. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there was some stuff Superman. that got done. Yeah, yeah. He's he's appeared a number of times since this. Yeah. Uh, uh, and, and I love the fact here that Hal is trying to tell Guy what to do. And guy's like, wait a minute, I'm the one in charge here. You know, I'm like, I'm the honor guard lantern. You're you're out of your sector. <laughs> and so Hal Hal promises Guy that if he dies, that Guy can have his little black book with all the home phone numbers in it, even Power Girls. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell's we? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Henshaw reveals then that. His motivation for destroying Coast City is the fact that his wife came from there, and he's trying to destroy everything connected to his past, and that really cements him as a new arch enemy. That that he destroyed Coast City on purpose. It was no accident at all. Poor troubled Hank Henshaw. Yeah, yeah, um, ma- makes him a great villain. It does. He's got a lot of depth, man. Yeah, be machine, half machine anyway. And uh, it, it's interesting um, how Hal and uh, Arishi have some interesting interactions. She basically kind of saves Hal from Hank Henshaw at one point. She severs his right arm at the robot parts. And uh, basically, he, they try to say what's going on. And she says, you know, where are we? And he says, on the Manhunter homeworld. Brilliant. How many Manhunters? The ring said 40.3 million. And then she goes, how many Green Lanterns are there? Well, not counting us, about 25, but 19 are unconscious. And the other six want me dead more than the robots. And she goes, so, same old, same old. (laughs) (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Uh, But it's interesting to see them working together. At uh, one point, Hal gets pulled into a High Master. Like, he's going to become one of the High Masters, and she gets in with him. And the two of them together are able to take control of the High Master, but the High Master amplifies their power rings like exponentially. And so they use the High Master to destroy the planet. And it melts the metal off of Cyborg Superman. So oh he's God. he's air quote dead again. <laughs> dead again. Side note to that, that spread with uh, Jordan, uh, Aresia, and Cyborg is really, really cool. I like the way yeah. her figure looks. The, the artwork, the artwork, Ivan Rice's artwork, I mean, again, I, this was the first time I had experienced his artwork, and I was just like, wow, you know, this guy is something else. He's special. He yeah, really he's is. He's good, man. Always has been good. I always look forward to his stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the Dana Moi comes, and um, Guy covers for Hal, says, you know, well, as, as it was my idea to go there, uh, I, I, I decided to be the one to do it, and the Guardians are like, I don't quite we don't quite believe you on this and so <laughs> he they basically say you know slack warned us that this is what we would expect when we had this conversation and so we're going to give you um your punishment and your punishment is prime duty and prime duty is guarding superboy prime in his cell with the red sun and he basically has to be there for a month and during that month he's not allowed to eat drink do anything basically his ring will give him what he needs to survive but he can't do anything he can't talk he can't do any of that stuff which has got to be torture for guy gardner <laughs> well not only that another foreshadow because he re- he comes out in sinestro cold war yes another little nice it reminds us that he's there because this is part of what happened with infinite crisis uh so we're reminded about all of that and again, it's again foreshadowing, so it, it acts as a bridge between the two events. Yep. Um, Hal and Arishia kind of say goodbye. Um, they kiss. He flies off. Uh, she's left behind on Oa, uh, probably getting reacquainted with all the other lanterns, all the new ones, and all the old ones as well. And then we get this really interesting teaser panel where we see Superboy Prime and... Basically, the Guardians are revealed to be concerned about a path that's inside of Sector 3601. And they don't want anybody going there, but one of the, some of them are going to go after Hank Henshaw. And the Guardians are concerned. You hear them all say 52. And again, this is after Infinite Crisis. And after Infinite Crisis, we went from one universe to 52 universes. And the Guardians are the only beings outside the monitors that know of the 52 universes. 
And now Earth is much more important because in this new continuity, the 52 universes all exist kind of in the same place. They exist overlaying our Earth. And if our Earth is destroyed, all the remaining 51 universes would be destroyed, which would only leave the antimatter universe. Ah, very cool. So, again, is this the secret that Hank Henshaw was talking about? Or was the secret Blackest Night? Or was the secret the fact that the emotional spectrum exists? Hard to say. Hmm. But, man, what a, what a great story arc. Because it, it, it bridges the old stuff, brings back some familiar characters, gets them back on the page, brings it back to the core, uh, reunites Hal and Arisha, just does a whole bunch of things. Plus, we get some good character stuff. Some little seeds are planted for upcoming Green Lantern events and things that are going on in the DC universe. Uh, I can't remember the last time I had a four-issue story arc that accomplished so much. No, that was a lot. And they packed a lot in there. Also, the writing... They, they, they did a lot with each individual. I mean, because every panel, you you at least had either something taking place or that was integral to their whole entire story arc, or you had some backstory being filled in, or you had some foreshadowing. I mean, they, they incorporated everything. Yeah, and, and the first time reading it, obviously, you didn't know necessarily what was, what this was teasing. Now we know it in hindsight. So you could argue that back, back in the day, maybe it sounded like there were some wasted panels here or there, but... It, we know it all becomes important and in short order, you know, it's uh, some series can go 11 issues and not tell us complete story. But anyway, I, I really, really enjoyed uh, talking about these issues. Uh, it made me excited all over again for this era. Uh, one of the things I think in hindsight, I, I realized about this era is, in the beginning, there was a lot of character development for Hal, but eventually Green Lantern becomes a very plot-heavy book and not so much a character-driven book. And there's nothing wrong with that, but uh, I think some people would criticize this as being kind of a... Uh, criticize the John's run as being not so great for the character. But I don't know. Uh, I, I think that we find out enough that we don't need to have that much character exploration. We understand the character. Now we get going with all interesting stories. I, I'm cool with that. Yeah, me too. Me too. I'd take this any day. You and me both. <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> All right. Well, my power ring is a blinking. I know we've got some listener feedback from the last episode that we we didn't finish. Uh, so we've got a couple of pieces of listener feedback. So why don't we take a quick pause? And when we come back, we'll have power ring, or my power ring, tell us what uh, what people have to say. Sounds great to me. What up, dweebs? This is Guy Gardner. You're listening to the podcast of OA. Green Lantern's Myron and Phil. Our first message is from Ken, who has several questions for you in honor of Green Lantern Hal Jordan's birthday. I have broken the message up into individual segments. Playing the first segment in 3, 2, 1. Hi, Myron and Phil. In celebration of Hal's birthday, I wanted to send some questions about him to some of his biggest fans. A. If Hal couldn't be a Green Lantern anymore, what would you have him be? He's been a Black Star, Renegade, The Spectre, Parallax, and been a part of every Lantern Corps. Would you have him go back to one of those roles, become a different type of superhero slash villain, or have him retire? Personally, I wouldn't mind seeing him become the White Lantern more permanently, training new GLs. Hey, Ken, thanks for your, your email. And I know this was with the carryover. This was something that, that originally Ken sent us back in February when it was Hal's birthday. Uh, so anyway, in regards to, to his first question, if Hal couldn't be a Green Lantern anymore, what would you want him to be? And and that's a tough one. I, I mean, I wouldn't want him to retire. I, I don't see Hal Jordan retire. He's not that kind of guy. Um, I could see him. I could see him becoming a White Lantern. You know, he did it before. Uh, without all the training and without mastering this, the emotions. I could see that. Um, it's, it's hard for me to picture him not being a Green Lantern, to be honest. But I know what I'd do. What would you do? I'd have him form his own Lantern Corps. You could, I mean, you could, you could stretch out the emotional spectrum. I mean, there's always been talk about the gray, gray Lantern kind of stuff, you know. But I think, I don't know if it's ever, I don't know if the story's ever been done before with Green Lantern to where he, I know he's went renegade, 
but where he starts his own core and takes key members with him, like people like Kilowog, Kyle, and all them, and he has his own Lantern core. Now, insert whatever emotional spectrum or whatever color coordination you want to do with it, but that's kind of what I'd do if he wasn't part of the Green Lantern core. Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to envision it a little bit. Um, one of the things that I could also see him doing is, uh, do you remember the plot that uh, was called the Green Lantern Corpse? Not the core. It was Corpse. It was the story where, where, where um, Rami Hall first debuted, and he, she teamed up with Guy Gardner, and Guy Gardner, for the story arc, became a member of the Green Lantern Corpse. Man, vaguely, maybe. Oh gosh, it's been a while. Yeah, it was. It was. It was a while ago. Um, it was a single mission. He was with Von Daggle. It was. Um, gosh, who wrote it? I, I'm gonna remember it here in a second. I know I'll remember it. Oh crap! Crap! I can't remember just now who did. It. I, I want to say it was Keith Champlain. Did it. So was it an arc or was it like a three issue arc? Or? Yeah, it was. It was a three issue arc, three or four issue arc, and um, she she was part of the green. This the special it had Von Daggle in it. In fact, they they revived Von Daggle during the the newer run of the Green Lantern Corps. Oh, gosh, I'm trying to rem remember all of it now, but I don't remember enough of it to. To save my life, but basically, the Green Lantern Corps took on missions. They were the they were the dark ops version of the Green Lantern Corps. I guess that's the best way to describe it. They took on the missions that nobody else would do. You know, they weren't the the clean version of the Corps. And it was it was Keith Champagne that did it, and basically, uh, he was requested to do a story, and it was with Pat Gleason, and it it was basically the first appearance of Ramey Hall. It was three issues. It was issues seven through nine of the Green Lantern Corps. And basically, they were set up to meet with the, with um, Von Daggle uh, in order to do a mission. And it was interesting. Uh, Jeff Johns didn't like the idea that there was a Black Ops version of the Green Lantern Corps that kind of broke the rules and followed a different set of, um, a different credo, essentially. And so it was kind of killed after that three-issue arc. But I remember talking to Keith Champagne at a comic book convention, and he actually had uh, another, like almost like a graphic novel story to tell with the Green Lantern Corps. It was all drawn, lettered, it was done, and DC kind of shelved it, unfortunately. <laughs> and it was, Again, how it was, often have we heard that? You know, anyway? right, right. I mean, now it could be it could be a multiverse story or an omniverse story. But uh, I know I remember that story. It was called The Dark Side of Green. It really resonated with Green Lantern fans who wanted more. Uh, but it was never referred to again until um, not too recently. It was done in a, a story in um, oh, a Robert Venditti story in uh, Green Lantern Corps number 27 during the Van Jensen run. They kind of brought her back and brought back Van Daggle. That was when John was looking for, you know, he had to go and be very creative on getting allies for the Green Lantern Corps. And that was what happened. Uh, but... I would have liked to have seen when Keith, Keith Champagne did it. I remember that convention, he was going to email me the, the the pages so I could read it, but it never happened. I think he probably got cold feet about like, you know, if I share this, it's going to get out. <laughs> right. Look at this fan nerd. He's going to share it with everybody. That's right. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I got to thank the power of ring ping ring. Yeah, boy. I, I want to thank the Power Ring for breaking this up into parts because um, Ken has uh, several questions for six questions. So why don't we go ahead and hear the second question. B. What's your favorite Hal Jordan costume? I know his uniform hasn't changed much, but as someone who also hates when they can't color Hal's boots right, I like how his design has changed over the years, especially from the Silver Age through the hard traveling heroes and great temples to finally his rebirth and new 52 looks. The new 52 is my favorite design for Hal since it felt consistent. The pointed boots and collar gave the costume a more angular and realistic feel to it and I've never cared for the costume disappearing into Hal's neck but I like the great temples for Hal since he should look more mature and older compared to all of the many, many new lanterns. There are also costumes to consider across other platforms like the movie, TV shows, and video games as well as his costumes for other roles as I mentioned in the last question. I did like the black and green gloves from Green Lantern, first flight but I will always prefer the white gloves. 
All right, man. Favorite Hal Jordan costume? Mine's easy. Renegade. Loved it. Still do. Did you, did you like the long hair too, or did you just just yeah. the cast for the whole look? I liked it all. I like the unshaven kind of look. You know, um, the long trench coat. It just it he it was cool. It was just really really cool. I'd actually like to see and maybe you can answer. I don't know if there's ever been like a wild wild west version of a Green Lantern member. There's the there was thing, there was that one arc that they did. Well, I don't even know if it was an arc, but they did, they did all the. Um, Oh, like, there was Superman. He was in the Wild West. He was a characterization of it. And then there was a Green Lantern guy, and he was holding a lantern. I mean, and he had like a green suit on or whatnot. I know but, there was a story with with um, Abin Sur that took place in the Old West, and he meets up with supposedly Hal's uh, great 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 grandfather kind of character. There was one of those, and there was also a story where uh, Hal and Batman go to the Old West through time travel and meet up with Jonah Hex. I remember that one, yeah, because I like Jonah Hex, so. But yeah, you know. And, but yeah, and, Renegade's been my favorite. I could see, you know, if we were looking for another role outside of Green Lantern, I could see Hal being um, a space cowboy. Yeah. I, I could see that. I could see that. Uh, I, I, My personal look, favorite look is, is I like the post-rebirth design where they got rid of the swimsuit trunks off the bottom of it, but I know in the beginning of the Jeff Johns run originally Ethan Van Skyver designed the boots so that they were sloped upwards, but, but the upward slope was on the outside of the boots, which looked kind of odd. And it, it was hard for writers to keep consistent. So I kind of like it with, with the square, you know, the flat boot design, but I, I like, I don't like the new 52 uh, shoulder epaulette thing look that they had there for a little while, but wow. I, I do like the modern version of his outfit. I think it's just they as much as I love the silver age design, I think that taking away the swim trunks makes it look better. Now, do you think the floating emblem on his chest should be significant with just Hal Jordan? Or do you think other core members should have that ability? I think it should be consistent because it's supposed to be like their siren, their, their, the, the, the spinning lights. It's, that's what it's supposed to be like. The problem is... is GC can't get them to keep the boots green correctly and be consistent with that or the power ring even being on a hand, let alone remember to do that. So I, I say get rid of it just because it's too much for our, for artists to keep track of it. Because like I said, the number of times we see either no power ring or the power ring on the wrong hand or <laughs> white boots, uh, they're, they're my three big pet peeves. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I don't trust them to remember to do that detail, so... Sure. I, I'm fine with it going away. Um, I gotcha. did like, and, and, and like Ken points out, I did like the look in, in First Flight too. But there's something about the white gloves that's so classic. Mm-hmm. I remember when they were working on the movie, they screen tested the white gloves, and they opted to go away from the white gloves because it didn't. They they felt like in live action it did not look right. I would imagine it was the color that would have thrown the viewer off. Yeah. Well, in the whole design of that movie costume it was so I didn't care for it because it just felt like it was a bodysuit. You know, there were no there were no boots on that costume. It was like he was barefoot. <laughs> I didn't like it at all. Well, that yeah. was cheesy. Um, but they did try the white gloves and it didn't look right, but I I think an animation looks great. I mean, when you look at the Green Lantern in the animated series, I think it looks fantastic. Yeah. If they could pull it off live action, I'd like to see it that way. But I could I could see the first flight look if you can't do it that way. Sure, sure. All right, well, let's go on to the third question. C. How old is Hal Jordan in your eyes? How long has it been since Abin Sur died and how many years has it been since Coast City exploded? I imagine Hal is in his mid-40s, starting as a Lantern 13 to 15 years ago, and it has been seven years since Coast City exploded. Hmm, how old is Hal Jordan? I mean, I guess I would, I would put him in his forties. I mean, I think that's about the average. I mean, that's what he says too. You know, that's kind of where I kind of pinpoint him at. Fifty's just too old. I feel like. (laughs) Oops, Fifty's just too old, man. (laughs) Uh, As far as characterization goes, I think Fifty would be off the mark unless you were going to do like a kingdom come kind of story i think the 50s is just fine for us normal mortals but for a superhero no. 
Uh, Let's say late forties, early fifties. <laughs> Uh, uh, for me, I think he would have been in his mid forties during the Emerald Twilight era, but I think when Rebirth came along, he he de-aged a little bit, much like Guy Gardner used his power ring to keep himself young. Uh, I think he de-aged, so I now picture him in his mid thirties or so. Okay, but I think only because of Emerald Twilight giving him the advantage. Makes sense. All right. All right, let's go on to the next one. D, who's Hal's true successor? I would say Kyle at the end of the day. So does Hal have a successor? Who is Hal's true successor? Gosh, I think right now he doesn't have a successor because he's still active. But certainly at the time, Kyle was, um, at the end of the day, as, as Ken says, was his successor. But now with Hal back, I don't think he has a true successor. And I'll be honest, is I feel like I, I'm one of those people that don't care for the whole legacy aspect of the DC universe. I think it's it's awful. Uh, I don't want to see these characters age and move on and new characters take over. They're already iconic classic characters. They don't need to have any of those things. But sure. I know that's controversial, but it's my opinion. Okay, man, I'm shooting for left field here on my po- my choice for successor. You ready? Sure. Simon Baz. <laughs> I knew you were going to say it. I knew you were going to say it. Uh, yeah, definitely not. Uh, I don't know. I don't even know who I would. I actually can't answer the question, to be honest with you. I mean, I always think of a successor as, well, I don't know. I always think of a Green Lantern as when <laughs> they die, the, the ring chooses somebody else, you know. And as far as hanging the ring down to somebody else, I don't, there's been so much misconstrued narrative when it comes to how this ring chooses people. It's like, all right, well, can you do that? I thought the ring had to choose. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe that person can choose for the ring that's supposed to choose for the ring. (laughs) You know, so I don't know. I mean, I'll, I'll go with the default Kyle, but at the end of the day, I don't, I don't think that's fair to Kyle anymore. I think, I think Kyle's proven his worth to where he he shouldn't have a successor type of role. He should have his own stand role. I can go with That's that. That's where I stand, though. But, uh, Ring, let's uh, hear the next question. E, thinking about the GL 80th anniversary special, who do you think would actually be the last three people Hal would ever call? Because one of them sure as hell as wouldn't be Bruce, I would think it would be Barry, John, and Carol with each person carrying a message for other people in Hal's life, E. Barry would say something to Ollie and Dinah for Hal, John to Guy and Kyle, and Carol to Jim and Tom. All right, well, let's see. The three people I think Hal Jordan would call. Okay, first off, I want to say I hate the fact that you had to put Bruce in there. I mean, because Batman has to appear everywhere. I don't, I don't want him calling Batman. If I had his choice, I would have him call Carol. And then I'd have him shoot a call to Kilowog. And then I'd have him shoot a call to Barry. I can see that. I, I can go along with that. I mean, free Carol's definitely. that That's a must-have. Mm-hmm. Uh, Carol, Carol has to be one of them. Uh, Barry, it, to me, it's either Barry or Ali, but I lean towards Barry. Uh, and then I was torn between uh, Kilowog like you, just because I love Kilowog, or his brother, or... Uh, my third choice would have been, I had it in my head too. Gosh, I can't remember now. Superman was my third choice. Oh, yeah, that'd be a good one. Because I always felt like Hal and, and Clark had a good relationship. It, it's it been downplayed. Like they haven't really done it as much as they should have. But the two of them have so much in common. And I would have, I would have think he would have talked to Superman, and he would have entrusted Superman to carry a message to the League, and so on and so forth. Sure, sure, that's a good choice. But I like it. All right, well, Power Ring, we got one more question, so go ahead and fire away. F. What point in Hal's history would you want to see further explored? Chad on the Lantern Cast talked about seeing more of Hal's time as a Lantern before meeting Tamar Ree and learning about the Core fully. I would like to see that or possibly an expansion of the pre-Blackest Night era so that we could fit parts of the TV show into the series. 
Thank you again for your great show and for listening to my feedback. All right. Well, Ken, first of all, thank you for the questions. These have been really good ones. Uh, so, you know, the question is, is if we could see more about Hal's time as a lantern, you know, in a different his part of history rather than current timeline, what would we want to see or read about? And I, I like the idea of going back to uh, the eighties during like the Steve Englehart era, because we were really getting a lot more exploration of the core. I'd like to see more of that. And you still had a uh, guy and you had John kind of in the background going back and forth. Uh, but I'd love to see more of that because there was more emphasis on the Green Lantern core than just the Earth Lanterns. And and that's been uh, my personal frustration, as we've kind of talked about a little bit on the show in the past, is that the more Earth Lanterns we get, the less that the Alien Lanterns get anything to do that has any any consequence. And I think that the Alien Green Lanterns, my opinion, are more interesting than most of the Earth Green Lantern characters. No, that's a strong point. And, I, and I'd second that one. Yeah. Um, as far as where I would want house history... I, I don't even know. I'd like to maybe a little bit of personal introspection into the the post Blackest Night dealings, but even one could argue that Brightest Day was used for that. But at the same time, I I kind of want to know what how I, I'd rather know what how felt personally with that whole ordeal it, instead of having it like um, diluted by. Um, other characters and other things and other and other events taking place. It would more or less just be an introspection of him and how he dealt with the weight of what took place. Yeah, I can I can dig it. Yeah, that'd be kind of cool. Well, again, Ken, thank you so much for the email. Uh, great, quick questions. I think it stimulated some great conversation. Uh, Power Ring, why don't you go ahead and play our next message? The last message is from Rilo. He has comments about the recent episode where you analyzed the relationship between Carol Ferris and Hal Jordan. Playback initiating in 3, 2, 1. This was way more than I ever knew about Carol, and I appreciate your research, Myron, to go through everything chronologically from the beginning. It's weird that I needed to learn about Carol by picking up early volume 3 issues after Emerald Twilight happened since I only started reading right before that. I've grown to understand the tension more. But even before listening to this episode, I did have the feeling that Carol hasn't been treated like I feel she should be in the DCU as a whole. I'll explain. There are many, many characters that exist in comics simply because of their relationship with the title character. Rogue's galleries are a good example, but there are plenty of other well-known characters that fit this description as well. Lois Lane, Alfred Pennyworth, and so on. Green Lantern has had its few as well, Tom and Cowgirl only exist because of Hal. Alex and Terry only exist to Ed because of Kyle, and so on. Unfortunately, even after Johns's appropriation of the Star Sapphires, it seems that Carol is still being treated as one of these characters, and I don't think that's the right call in her case. She became Star Sapphire a long, long time ago. At the time, this was done to accentuate the link between her and Hal, a negative will circle back too, but it also made her a meaningful entity in her own right. Whether the Violet Core remains a thing or not, I do away with them the Star Sapphires have long been their own thing and can give Carol a presence in DC wholly her own. I don't feel her introduction into the universe, long-standing relationship with Hal, and the analogous nature between two universe-spanning organizations should mean that she has to exist only in GL comics, or when being used solely as a complementing lantern. Carol should not exist solely as a squeeze. She had work and a romantic relationship with Hal, but she's been given more than that, and I don't think she should remain solely an accenting character. I'm not saying she should get her own book, but I do think there can be a developed relationship with her and Diana discussing the nature of love as a driving force, something Diana has a unique view on herself. This can even lead to ideological discussions about how best to handle certain enemies among Diana's rogues, and serve to further differentiate Diana from Yara. Yara can continue to develop in her own role and find herself, while Diana can become more reflective through her relationship with Carol. To reiterate, Carol only existing or being used as a relationship target simply isn't fair in another way. Kyle and John have both gone many years without a significant other. Kyle might have experienced heartbreak more, but he's also gone years without a partner and did so without issue, John even more so. Why are the males able to exist without being defined by their romantic relationships? I guess it'd be easier to give Carol her own time as a strong hero character if there was a title that focused on the remaining core as a whole but I'm against the idea of the Rainbow Core anyway and want to see the Sapphires, and Yellow Lanterns, return to their own origins anyway. 
Dunno. A lot more can be said, but as you've shown, it's really up to the writer. Thanks again for your research. Hey, thanks, uh, Rilo. Let's see. Um, well, you know, I don't, I don't think Carol Ferris is the type of character that should be took, that should be pushed to a second tier role. Um, Carol Ferris rates up there like Mara does with Aquaman and, and, um, Lois Lane does with uh, with Clark Kent. Um, I just I see Carol Ferris as too an integral of a part of Hal Jordan Green Lantern Corps history, to where she just shouldn't just be relegated to second tier. So uh, I I want her own title. I'd like to see her own book. I personally would like to see a small little expose on like a maybe a three issue or five issue arc on Carol Ferris as a little story about how she functions in her environment and her workplace being the top tier executive for her, for her uh, company, her dad's company. Um, I think that would be kind of cool. Um, other than that, I'd like to see us. I'd like to see her as part of a star Sapphire uh, ongoing title, uh, or at least an inclusion in some way, uh, part of a green Lantern core book to where she played a, a major role. I'll run on a limb and say I'd like to see Carol Ferris as part of the Justice League. There you go. You went way out there. Even Mara did Well, kind of Mara kind of made that role, but not really. And I look at it because it'd, it'd be interesting. Uh, Rilo points out a little bit about a conversation that Carol can have with Diana. And, and I was thinking about that. And I thought, you know, there's really a lot of potential there for if the book starts talking about character on a, you know, an ongoing basis, not just is subplots. If the character, if the, if the relationship between the characters in the justice league were given a little more time to develop, Carol could be really interesting in dealing with characters like Diana or anybody who's got a romantic relationship because talking about the nature of love, just, just as Rylo points out, I think that could be really, really interesting if it's done by the right writer. Well, not only that too, you, you're, you're looking at an exploration from uh, the vantage point of a, of a, uh her being a strong female character that's often placed in a, in a, I mean, more or less a strictly male book, right? I mean, Carol shows up, a few other females show up. Now she is the top tier Green Lantern character, Carol Ferris. And even though other females are showing up, there's still subordinate role, right? But at the same time, <clears throat> Carol being elevated to a status to where she had other peers like Diana or Lois Lane for that matter, Mara, it'd be neat to see her bounce off of these other dominant female characters uh, and, and the universes they exist. Now, you could go on on a limb here and you could push the agenda and do an all-female Justice League and call it a, a Disney version of what they did with uh, <laughs> the Avengers. <laughs> and just do a Carol Ferris and just do a Lois Lane and a Mara. I mean, who else would you throw in there? Yeah, you could throw Poison Ivy in there. What the heck, man? You know, just... Put some random character. Oh, wait a minute, Catwoman. She'd have to be in there, right? Right, right. Barbara Gordon, maybe. But can you imagine the conversation that Carol could have with Catwoman? Yeah, it'd be cool. Yeah, because uh, it's never. I mean, I bet you this never happened in the history of comic books. Yeah, uh, it, it, there's a lot of potential there, and I really like. You know, Rilo brings it back. The whole thing is that when you go back and look at those beginning issues. Carol was really there. The, the Green Lantern stories in Showcase were just as much as a romance book as it was anything else. And I guess that's that goes back to this was just after the return of superheroes were coming back to comics. And did they kind of want to walk that line of well, saying, well, this isn't a superhero comic, it's a romance book. Right. <laughs> you know? <laughs> did they kind of hedge their bets? Much like when Stanley did the Fantastic Four, the reason why the thing looks like the thing is that he could say it was a monster book if he had to. Uh, you know, is is that part of it? Uh, it? It could be, but she did exist mainly as a, a, a squeeze for Hal. Uh, and and we, you know, we'll go back to that episode we did, which, which to me is one of my favorite episodes we've ever done because it was really a deep dive into the character. Uh, you, you start to find out that she really wasn't utilized the way that she could have been. And once she became a star sapphire, and once she went from being a villain and being a pure villain and coming back and being on the positive side during the Johns run the potential for that character opened up, but it really hasn't been leveraged. Right. Yep. You're right. But it, uh, it, it reminds me of something uh, over on Facebook in our Facebook group. Somebody mentioned how much they liked 
uh, that episode and said, you know, we really should do an episode on Soren Ignatu. That would be kind of cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that would be kind of fun. I mean, for that matter, we could even do one on Arishia. Yeah. So I think maybe in April, because we only have one issue of Green Lantern in the middle of April, maybe we'll do a deep dive in Soren Ignatu uh, for one of our episodes next month. What do you think? That'd be a cool time. Cool. I'd be done with that. Right, well, thank you so much for your email, and uh, I loved your commentary on Carol. I, I, I think it's right on point. Uh, so, Powering, why don't you tell everybody how they can be a part of the show, and then we'll come back and wrap things up. You can become a part of the show by leaving a message up to one minute long on our voicemail line. Call us at 406 pod of oa That's 406-763-6362. You can also email us at podcast at blogofoa.com. We'd love to hear from you. This is Robert Vendetti, and you're listening to the Podcast of Oa. All right, fellow Owens, episode 207, Down and Done. Uh, continuation of the John's Run, which is always a plus. And uh, any listeners out there, make sure that you go back and, and focus on the John's Run. It's a... Uh, it's, it's they're great issues. They're, they set the they set the standard for what it is to be Green Lantern Corps. That's true. It, it's kind of the gold standard at this point. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll and everybody always reflects back on it. You know, hey, where should I start off? Start off a rebirth. It's usually their first response anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of you know I think Secret Origin is a good origin story, but the problem with that is that it brings Atrocitus into it, and it kind of spoils some of the things that Johns was building up to. Mm-hmm. That having it as a flashback story makes sense. Sure, having it be published kind of out of order makes sense. But yeah, if you could start with with Rebirth, that's really a good starting point. And you know, if if you were starting it, I'd say you know go back and read up on what happened during Emerald Twilight and the Kyle stuff, but then jump into Rebirth, and you should be good to go. But it's I don't want to underemphasize the importance of the Green Lantern Corps run because that book was paramount to the success of the franchise because it took all these characters that we're seeing come back into the fold it gives them a place to play and really gives them a lot of character which you know as, as we've said before is difficult when you're focusing on one or two characters or you've got right now you need two hands to count the number of green lanterns from earth uh, they they monopolize the page count so you don't get all the good stuff that, that we're missing. And to me, that was always the strong point of the Green Lantern Corps mythology was having all these really cool alien characters that are so strong and so cool on their own. Yep. But, I agree. Well, friends, thank you as always for making us a part of your fan experience. We will be back in a few weeks. Uh, either we'll be talking about the next issue of Green Lantern, the finale of the the Thorn Run, or we'll be talking maybe about Sornik Natu. Or maybe we'll be talking about Arishia. I don't know, but no matter what it is, it's going to be a good time uh, because I'm going to be talking to my good buddy, Phil. <laughs> That's right. I hear you, man. It's always fun talking. I love doing this. I just have such a great time. I always look forward to our episodes. Me too. Me too. So everybody, uh, this wraps up the episode. As always, please keep your power ring charged, treat each other well, and make every day your brightest day. Take care. The Podcast of Oa is the official podcast of the Blog of Oa and a proud member of the Comics Podcast Network. Share your comments and questions by calling the show's voicemail line at 406 Pod of Oa. That's 406 763 6362. You can send your emails to podcast at blogofoa.com. You can also find the Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa on Twitter and Facebook. Green Lantern and other related characters are the copyrighted property of DC Comics Incorporated and are used without permission. The Blog of Oa and the Podcast of Oa are fan productions and do not claim any ownership over the Green Lantern or any other copyrighted properties.